on this episode of the Make Ideas Reality podcast. So uh, what I do is on my socials, I tag myself as artist, designer, and maker of things. Maker of things is the um, collection of skills. I, I'm continuously collecting skills. They found out that there was a computer system that could do that could do art on a computer. Okay, that's like, okay, get, you can wrap your head around that. That's an electric thing. You're selling a piece of art, but somebody's going to plug that in their wall. You know, is it going to get hot? Is it going to catch on fire? Of course, lamps always catch on fire, right? I mean, they just, they just burst into flames when you plug them in. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, well, you know, right? That's, it's an electric motor, that's okay? Amazing. Actually, that blew up on TikTok. I've got over 3 million views of me running that on TikTok because some people thought that it was an energy generator. <laughs> so funny, I said it was a motor, but, but again, that, that's okay, a so failure of our education <laughs> system, Bernie. Yeah, I know. Hello and welcome to make ideas reality. The podcast. This is a podcast dedicated to everyday creative heroes, making their ideas reality that wouldn't necessarily get their story heard. I hope to inspire you with their stories give you courage to leave your comfort zone, think big, and be the badass creator you were meant to be. I'm Justin White, aka The Garage Avenger. Let's do this! Hello and welcome to the Make Ideas Reality Podcast. Today's guest has been a creative from day dot. From commercial illustration to helping kids build a robot. Ever wondered how one man could have so much talent? Well, 40 years of persistence and hard work gives him valent. He may not have made the Kessel run in less than 12 parsecs, but he's not scared to jump into high... high, I can't even say that word. (laughs) High space (laughs) to find new prospects. Welcome to the show... Bernie Solo from so- Works by Solo. <laughs> wow. Thanks, Justin. <laughs> yes, I know. Han was a great, 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 great uncle of mine. <laughs> it's good to know. I couldn't, I couldn't do this episode with some sort of tie to Star Wars. I don't know why. I just felt like I needed to. Yeah. That's my real, it's my real last name. It is. I'm glad it's your real last name because I'd be embarrassed if it wasn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's actually French. It's it's derived from from French. It was spelled a little bit different in France, but uh, yeah, but it's real. But how how do you spell it in French? I and mean, does it do you say uh, it S- No, it's a, it's the same. S A U S A U L A U. Okay. So yeah, yeah. So 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 low. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. it's interesting because I always seem to balls up my guest names and yours is like the only one that I probably <laughs> feel like I can't balls up. Like oh, I was it, even... It, it, it does get messed up because it's so simple. It's like it, that, that can't be it. So, you know. Because <laughs> <laughs> I was toying with ideas about this podcast that I like, I balls up so many guest names. I like would make it a thing. <laughs> so like every episode, regardless of the person's name, I balls it up. Even like Bernie Solo, I would somehow balls that name up, but I decided to not do that. But um, let's get into the podcast, Bernie. Um, sure. Who is Bernie Solo? Well, let's see. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm going to give you a, uh, what I would call an elevator pitch, probably. Like if we had just a few seconds, minutes, maybe. Um, so what I do is on my socials, I tag myself as artist, designer, and maker of things. And the reason that I did that was because that's, that's, uh, that's the quick intro, right? So uh, artist as like the, uh, the creativity portion of like what makes up what I do. And I, I, I did go to art school. I've been trained as an, a professional artist, a commercial artist, um, designer. Because I like designer is as close to an engineer <laughs> as I think I can get. So that's kind of my, if people don't know quite what designers are, they are people that would work. Like I'm from the Detroit area, so automotive, everything's kind of tied into automotive with me. And um, automotive designers work with the engineers. And they're between 
the, uh, the, the people that come up with the concept, say the concept artists and the engineers, they don't, they're obviously not thinking on the same plane. So they put the designer in between it kind of does a little bit of both. So they're a little bit of the creative side and also a little bit of the engineering side. Cause I don't have uh, engineering training at all, but I really like engineering. So that's why I say designer. And then the maker part of it, the maker of things is the um, collection of skills. I, I'm continuously collecting skills and that's the like fabricating, building things, uh, whether it's wood, metal, plastics, or whatever. So that's the maker. So that's kind of like, I guess, why I put the trilogy on my, my description like that. Does that sound right? Sound good? <laughs> yeah, man. Was that the elevator ride? <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, I, I heard about you at Make Essential, and I think I saw you, but you and I never talked. I, I don't I, think so, at least anyway. I don't think... I don't think so, but you just look so, we must have passed. And I just uh, said the word talked and it's clearly spoken. Like we never spoke. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, But I mean, the other thing is I kept on hearing your name after Maker Central. um, And then, you know, everyone like kept on showing these fidget spinners and, you know, your name is very connected to those fidget spinners. And, you know, and then of course you and I had some small interactions online and then uh, just recently you commented on something that I posted and I thought, oh, that's it. Bernie's on my show. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been watching and, and, and you're, I would say almost all of your guests, at least the, the, the recent ones, I've, I've either met or I know from online. So, you know, it was like, it's just like a big group of, you know, people. It's a, it's a maker community, right? I mean, everybody seems to know everybody at some level. Yeah, for sure. Um, let's get into your journey. Uh, you've got an epic journey to where you are. Like, and I, I want to give you the opportunity to share that here on this podcast. Um, you and I had this chat in the pre-pod and I got to hear the whole thing with all of the bells and whistles. And I was just sort of amazed at the journey you've been on in regards and the experiences you've you know gained in your journey and i thought you know why don't you start where it all started and then work your way to present day and and we'll see how much we can cover in in this podcast (laughs) well i I appreciate you using the word epic instead of old (laughs) (laughs) i'm epic yeah so you're this old guy and you've got this long story (laughs) oh um okay well Sorry, guys. Sorry to jump in here. Um, Before Bernie goes into his epic journey, uh, I just wanted to tell you guys that I've had to cut this down a lot. Uh, The original podcast was around two and a half hours, and I let Bernie go on a tear, and it was amazing. But to make this podcast a little bit more digestible, I decided to cut it down and edit it up a little bit. Saying that, I really think the two and a half hour version of this podcast is really worth listening to. If you're a Bernie fan, I suggest you go listen to that. Now I'm going to post it on my Patreon. Uh, you don't have to sign up to be a Patreon at all. Not one bit at all. Uh, just go straight on there. Is You'll see it as a public post. Click on it, listen to it, uh, and enjoy 100% of Bernie. I, okay, start starting way back. I, I've, um, I've been doing art drawing. Well, like, I would imagine almost all children are, are artists. I, I mean, all the ones that I've ever met, my own kids, um, you know, they're very creative because uh, w- when, when we're all young, there's really, uh, there's, there's not many rules, you know, nobody's told us that we're doing it wrong a whole lot. And, um, you know, we're always experimenting and things like that. So I was fortunate enough to um, have parents that were either letting me do whatever I wanted to do or they <laughs> just weren't paying attention. <laughs> so, and then, um, so getting into school, I, I had, um, you know, my, my, my little friends when I was in the younger, low grades uh, in school um, had recognized what I was doing. And I was doing drawings of um, contraptions and things like that when I was in, uh, like in, in elementary school. And uh, getting some attention also, you know, people saying, well, that's really neat, you know, which, you know, kind of feeds the fire. And, and that, and then getting uh, getting a little bit older and getting into high school, uh, I, I can say now back at the, back then it was it was traumatic. 
but I was, uh, I was, I was failing at academics um, in high school. You know, and of course, being a teenager and, and that there's so much else going on and, you know, teenagers' heads are just, you know, berserk. And uh, so uh, I, in order to, to, um, to save my grade point average, I, fi- I found some other classes that I could take in school. And lucky for me back then, and some school, schools are still doing it now. Um, a lot of them aren't, but we had a lot of vocational programs. We had a uh, metal shop, wood shop, which are pretty st- typical standard, but um, I was fortunate enough to have uh, a couple of photography classes. I had a class that actually, we actually had a printing press in our school, a little, a very small printing press, but I learned how to do uh, the photographic process for making the printing plates and being able to print things like that. And it was, I was fascinated with that, that type of thing, which kind of got, you know, it got me into thinking about graphic arts. And then the photography led me to working with, um, the yearbook staff, which is, it's, it's a class and the students, you put together the yearbook, you know, for the year collecting photos and shooting new photos and things like that. And then in addition to, to that, not just shooting the photos, but I was going out and talking to sponsors for the yearbook to, that would, you know, donate money for publishing the yearbook and what it cost you know, to print it and things like that. And um, I was shooting photography of their businesses and of their products. So like say like um, you know, one example is like a pizza, a pizza restaurant, pizza place um, that, you know, was going to be a sponsor and I would go there and take pictures of their, you know, pizzas and stuff like that and then bring them back. And so it kind of got me thinking about, um, and I think a big tie in that you'll probably hear throughout m- this interview is that uh my artwork or creative work, it, it seemed like from a very beginning, it had a, it had a purpose to it. And now f- reflecting back to those when I was in the lower grades and doing the drawings of contraptions, it's like it wasn't art for art's sake. It was art because I was drawing, I was drawing a contraption. I was drawing a machine. It wasn't a, it was sort of a piece of art. Do you know what I mean? It's a Oh, it was yeah. a description of a machine. It was, it was like a, I would like to build this thing, you know, and so here's a, here's a drawing to show you what I want to build. It wasn't a, look at this nice picture as a piece of art. So, so, and I didn't realize that until years later that it started to tie in. And so then once that stuff all kind of, you know, started, uh, I guess, you know, solidifying. And uh, also going to, to go to university, um, again, my, my uh, academic level, now even though my grade point went right back up to 4.0 grade point because I was taking all of the things that I love to do um, in my school, I had a great grade point average, but I wasn't academic to a point where I could apply to colleges or any sort of like a academic studies, but that didn't matter because at that point, by the time I was you know 18 years old, graduating from uh, high school, looking at colleges, I found there was actually a pretty prominent uh, art school that did that had a um, major in commercial art in in Detroit, which was only about a thirty minute drive from where I lived. So I didn't even have to stay at the school. So I, I um, applied to the College for Creative Studies. It's called now. It was called something different back then, but College for Creative Studies in Detroit, uh, CCS they call it for short. Um, I applied there. And when you apply to an art school, it's perfect for me because they said, we need to see your grade point average. And it (laughs) it didn't really matter. It was like, okay, thanks. Let's see your portfolio now. Yeah. You know, to see if you're, if you're a good fit here. And um, my portfolio, it it wasn't outstanding, but it had, it had things in it that were, that were not like fine art paintings and things. They were drawings of, you know, contraptions and I even had a couple of drawings of cars in there which I found out later that that school was just it was um the car companies in Detroit had their eye on the uh the students at that school for being car car designers or car stylists yeah, yeah. um and that that was a that's that was actually a major because it's a Detroit school there was actually a major for automotive uh styling mm. Um, and other schools have it too, but I'm just saying that that was, and it was tied right in because there was um, General Motors and uh, Ford Motor Company, Chrysler Corporation, uh, were actually um, supporters of the school. 
Uh, it's a pri- private school, so you know they would get funding, you know, from private sources and corporate sources and things like that. So it's kind of tied in there. So it was neat because I was I was right into um, uh, a, an art program in college that was for like professional artists. I mean, call it professional artists, not not like a, a, a an artist that would do their art and then and then attempt to sell it like in a gallery setting, but artists that were commissioned or, you know, contracted to do work. Yeah, so like a, you, you a commercial a, illustrator or artist, right? Yeah, you get paid, right. Like you agree on a price, like I'm going to do this job for you and, and uh, you know, this is the price. This is what we're going to do. So, it, you know, it was a, it was a you know, more business-like approach, you know, to, to doing it. So, um, uh, and there's, the, there's a lot of... Um, uh, things that I, I think, well, at least back then, there uh, stuff that people didn't even realize. Uh, there's a funny story, and I shared this with you in our, our, our pre-show chat, where when I was in high school, stepping back a minute, uh, on the yearbook staff, not only did I do uh, the photography for them, but I did the art, some of the graphic art for the, for the yearbook, the divider pages, and I also had the opportunity to do the artwork for the cover of the book. And I remember going home and showing my mother that I had done the cover of the, the book. And she says, what do you mean you did, you did the cover of the book? These are books. You, it's, a, it's a book. How can you do, uh, did you draw on this cover of the book? And I said, no, it, no, I did the art. And then it was processed and printed. The cover of the book was manufactured from my artwork. And she, it was just, she couldn't get her head around the fact that somebody, that there was art that was somehow processed and printed on a h- hundreds of books. You know, it would just, it didn't ever occur to her that somebody had to do that. And then, and then it blew her away that it was her son. <laughs> like, it's like, you what? Like they took your drawing and then they put it on your, you know, so it was one of those, um, it, was, it was really interesting, you know, to, to, uh, to explain that to her, you know, because my parents, again, my parents were very open. It was great because not only did they, I think that there were those little things that dawned on them sometime eventually when I, once I was in college and they finally got a grasp on that, that could be a career. Mm. Cause I, I think that there were probably <laughs> people in my family. I probably wasn't privy to that were like, he's going to art school. Oh, great. You know, it's like, yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, uh, we'll see if he can get a job after that. But it, but um, I ended up in college. I ended up getting a um, a co op program into the co op program, which means I worked. I'd go to school for a semester, and then I would go to work for a semester, and I ended up working for one of my instructors, who was a uh, owner of owner and artist of a art studio. And in Detroit, back then, not too many around now, but uh, there were actually art studios that would there were you know these companies that would have. Um, you know, not a lot, but I, the biggest art studio in the Detroit area at the time, I think had 80, 80 employees. Wow. Artists, designers, uh, salespeople, uh, production people, things like that. Uh, the studio I worked at was, I think at the biggest, there may be like a dozen people working there, you know, so there would be like um, uh, several graphic designers, uh, designers that would do typography. Um, uh, designing the ads and things like that. So there would be, um, you know, there was maybe three or four or five of the people working on stuff like that, men and women. And uh, there was, let me see, one, two, three, four, five. There was probably five illustrators there. There was one illustrator that just did black and white, uh, black and white graphic arts type things. He did a lot of newspaper ads for um People. He had a really great style that was just just black and white. He did just an ink, ink, black ink on white, you know. And then there was uh, two artists. One guy did a uh, type of um, like cartooning type of illustration. Another guy did um, more realistic type paintings. Uh, there was a fellow that did uh, airbrush art, which is what I took after. I just got into doing airbrush, the actual real, real spray <laughs> airbrushing. Uh, which really lent itself to um, product, like realistic product renderings. And that's, that's what I got into. And probably because I really like photography. And, um, 
to do product illustration in my training, uh, part of it was that because you're doing a product, it's not like, it's not like I'm just going to paint this bottle of Coca-Cola, you know, any way I want. <laughs> it's got to be, you know, their product. So the, it depended on good photography. So if I wanted a, a um, you know, the product to look good in my illustration. Well, if I shot photography and I actually set up the lighting and the reflections and all that stuff and did a really nice, you know, photo of it, then when I did my product um, rendering, my illustration of it, which it would be enhanced. Like it would be, it, it, they were illustrations. They weren't supposed to look like photos, but they, they were enhanced. Like they were, um, if, so you, if you go back and you look at the illustrations. The, you're exaggerating the lighting, for example, or or the glee. Yeah, and everything like, more uh, colorful. Like a, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it popped. Like, if you go back and look, um, the big changeover, actually cars, it, well, at least in domestic automotive um, in America, um, it was right about 1960. Between 1960 and 1962, if, if you go back and look at old uh, automotive advertising, that those years were the were the were when it when it did its pivot. Uh, before, before that, those the cars were painted. They were painted illustrations of the cars for the advertising and for the, even for the car catalogs. And then after that, photography kind of started taking over, but it took over very quickly. Um, and then went into the cars were photographed after that. So illustration, um, like I said, right up until probably the early '60s, um, a lot of ads, even even ads, even with people in them things like that they're beautiful if you ever if you want to just really get inspired uh, for any sort of uh um any sort of illustration or artwork um look at some old advertising it's just it's it's amazing it's just i, I think it's just beautiful stuff i have a small collection of old advertising i always thought it was really really neat so i was really fortunate you know to get into um doing graphic arts and commercial art uh before digital art just just at the end of it, I got into it because in 1990, which is the year, it was either 89 or 90, that Photoshop was invented. Hmm. So Think about that, guys. I, wow. <laughs> yeah. And so I got out of, I graduated high school in 81, got out of um, university in 85. So I had five years of working as a commercial artist before Photoshop. Say, so before we were going digital and there wasn't any digital photography because that came quite a while later. Mm -hmm. um, but the, but our doing artwork on a computer. Um, so the Macintosh was introduced in 84. Um, so that was kind of like, yeah, you know, so if I, if I tell you those couple of things, you can kind of, kind of get a feel for that, that era that, uh, you know, that I was in with that. I was getting into the business of doing um, art, you know, art for, uh, you know, doing, doing commercial art. And again, you know, I want to point out too that, um, you know, there's, well, I was going to say like, you know, uh, artists, well, like anybody else, I mean, the photographers, same way, you know, painters, uh, some people tend to want to stay, or they, call, they would call themselves a purist, you know, mm -hmm. like, oh, I can't, I wouldn't do art for somebody else. I can't have somebody else tell me how to do my art or do my photography or, I won't crop my photos. I have to shoot my photos in the camera and they've got to be exactly, you know, the way that it's because it's a, I'm capturing, you know, blah, 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 all that stuff, which is fine. And I, and I do that stuff. It's like, a, it's not like I don't do it. I, I, I do it. If I want to do a painting or whatever my, of anything I want to do, I'm free to do any artwork that I want to do. And I can go, and I have said pieces in galleries, um, you know, or photography that way. But also to be able to turn around, I think, my skills, and you know, this will probably tie into some stuff later on too, is that my skills for problem solving, um, I think that really refined them because I, they weren't my problems. I was, I was solving problems for other people. You know, like they needed something. They needed a picture to do a certain thing or to communicate a certain way, um, you know, to grab attention or to... Um, you know, to say something or to enhance their product, you know, the way they wanted it to do. And it was like, I, I, I think that that, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's an area of creativity that I just, I really embrace it. Yeah. That you I want to get into, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. let, let's figure this out, you know, type of a thing. So. That's not me at all. <laughs> but you know what? Like people like Carol, Carolina Hintz, 
she's amazing. Yeah. She like she's able to understand what the client wants and then build something from nothing into it. You know, like and we're talking big artworks and big stage production stuff that she yeah. does and she's amazing at it. But she just me, finished the Lego figure. Did you see that? That yeah. was just this morning. The yeah. Lego figure she did. Yeah. <laughs> it was amazing. I commented on it. <clears throat> so you know, like I love the fact that there are people that can do that. Like for me personally, I definitely can't do that. Like I, I, I made this, you sure. know, sofa beer fridge for someone else. Uh, I couldn't deal with the stress of even just delivering it, even though I had pretty much <laughs> creative control over it. You know, the 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 idea of delivering it to someone, you know, when it was my kind of baby, is hard for yes. me. You know, so yes. yeah. Well, in that on that topic right there, um, going to going to university, going to art school, um, one of the things that we would do, it didn't matter which subject it was, what classes they were, um, and it wouldn't be just an art school. I'm just saying, in my experience, being in art school, having critiques. When a, when a, I would finish a a piece, a project, or an assignment. Um, the way that it usually works uh, is that we bring out, everybody brings them in the day that everything is due. There's a deadline, which, you know, you're working for a deadline. You're not just doing art for the sake of whenever you feel like it. There's a deadline. Uh, you know, you put it up on the rail. They call it the rail and you, everybody, the whole class, all the students put their art up on the rail, whatever it is. If it was a graphic design, if it was, a, you know, like for an advertisement or for an outdoor um, uh, advertisement, like a billboard. <clears throat> Um, and maybe we're not full size, but I mean, you'd be a sketch of it, you know, Yeah. yeah. Um, or, or painting or anything like that and put it up there in the instructor professor would go through and one by one um, uh, critique them, which is, you know, going through it and, you know, say if he, th he or she thought that it met the requirements of the, of the assignment and, um, you know, giving pointers out and mostly it was constructive. I mean, there's <laughs> a few that were destructive, but, uh, you know, mostly it would, they, they were there to teach us. And uh, some of the uh, instructors, the way they did their critiques is they, they would go through and do the critique, and then they would open it up to the rest of the class. Oh, that's So the class could go through. Yeah, and, and you could critique, well, but you had to be careful what you, you know, what you said, because that <laughs> person that you're talking to is going to be talking about your art next, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but it was good. It was really good. And... um I think that probably not knowing it at the time, but was helping me get a little bit thicker skin, you could say, about about taking criticisms and also, you know, taking and, and having somebody tell me that my art didn't meet the requirements. You know what I mean? It, it's, it's almost hard to say, like, your art doesn't meet the requirements. But but that was my, that was training and then getting on the job training because I was in that co-op program. Um, you know, doing something that I thought was just really nice. You know, this is just great, you know, and having it be like, yeah, that, you know, the client saying that is great, but that's not what we ask you to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, or it's not exactly quite, you know, it doesn't this or that or whatever. And it could be even a mechanical thing because yeah. maybe, maybe it was a, it was an ad or it was something that needed to go into, um, say it needed to go into three or four different formats, you know, and you painted the paint, the whole thing, you paint the background, the whole thing. And you find out that there was a version of it that was horizontal and you didn't paint enough background. Like, you know, and it's a painting. It's not like a, you can't push the undo button on a computer and just <laughs> yeah, go back and do it you. or just grab it and stretch it wider. You know, it's a, it was, it was paint. <clears throat> do you think, you know, paint on a board, so. Do you think that, you know, because you are working and living in Detroit with the big car industry and everything that, that you know, and, the, and like these, these are big companies we're talking about. Like they've got to yeah. be pretty like <clears throat> hard on exactly what they want. Does that, you know, has that influenced the way you did your work or the way you approached it or like how was, how has the city of Detroit sort of helped you and influenced your work? Let's see. I guess early on, it really wasn't a whole lot. It was, it was, it was, it was a lot of, a lot of fun, but, um, 
Well, let's and talk then, about let's talk about the next part of your career. Like, where'd you go? Yeah, after, after commercial illustrating. Where okay, did you go into that. Yeah, yeah, because that does tie into closer to automotive. Because when I was doing airbrush painting work, um, it got to a point, probably at the the peak of that part of my career, I was working almost exclusively for Coca Cola. So I was in Detroit, but Coca Cola is based in Atlanta, and so was their ad agency. In fact, I think their ad agency was integral to the in, in the corporate uh, offices. I don't think they had an outside advertising firm at the time, so they were we were working directly with in, inside Coca Cola's marketing team there. Um, so at that point, uh, that was nineteen. That would have been nineteen ninety. Um, that was when some friends of mine that I knew that were working at another art studio in, in Detroit, they, they found out that there was a computer system that could, do, that could do art on a computer. Okay, that's like, okay, get, you can wrap your head around that. <laughs> that sounds so old. You would school. say, <laughs> it could get like art on a computer. And there was this, a company out of England called Quantel. You could probably still look them up. Quantel Paintbox. It was originally a, a, a video um, graphics system, and then they had come out with a version of it that was higher resolution that you could do artwork for print on their their computer. And it was a big computer. Um, the cabinets, we had three cabinets, and they were about five feet tall, by like four feet deep, <clears throat> a couple feet wide. The hard drives had these um, these straps that would be fabric straps that we'd have to go underneath the hard drive in the thing. Like we had to move them and take them out. We didn't have to remove them every day, but there was some maintenance we had to do a few times. <clears throat> and it took two people to pick up the hard drives. I mean, they were, and, uh, um, so I'm, I I'm started seriously just that. looking at my one terabyte. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just like, <laughs> what the heck? That I'm, yeah. I'm only imagining it was like, it probably wasn't even, I'm like, it was probably kilobytes or maybe a couple of megabytes on those big things. They were those big ones I was telling you about picking up. They were 650 meg. Oh, fuck. <laughs> and we had two of them. So we had 1.2, it was like 1.23 gig um, for two, two of those drives. So, and then, so the thing is, is that it wasn't so, so just, just a step one, half a step back in 1990, uh, these friends of mine, they formed this company that they got this computer system and they needed somebody to come in and help, you know, to, to train on it to be, because there were no digital artists in, 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 the, in Detroit anyway. I mean, it was kind of probably globally just coming all around to being able to do digital graphics and digital art stuff. <clears throat> like I said, Photoshop 1.0 was was either 89 or 90. So, it, so there wasn't any PC like small, like Mac or, or Windows, like small computer, personal computers. There wasn't, you could program graphics on them to program it to do color, some sort of graphic, like 8-bit type stuff at the time. But it wasn't like you couldn't do any photos or illustration type stuff. So, so there was, that, that's what they wanted to do. They, they wanted to do artwork digital artwork and they wanted to be some of the first people to do it. So these, these two partners took out um, a huge loan, got this computer, needed somebody to work on it. So short story is I got involved with them. I left my job. That was the, on the drawing board. Um, you say I still have a drawing board <laughs> back there. Um, uh, painting <clears throat> and went digital. I just jumped into digital, learned it as fast as I could. Um, and we started doing art on the computer. Well, the system was so expensive, they weren't able to um, uh, cover the cost by doing illustration work on the computer because it, it was just going to be cost prohibitive for the clients because of the cost of the system and the hourly um, costs. Um, we came up, they were billing me at the time. Think, think about this. This was 1990. So I don't know if you can do the economics of it, but whatever the dollar value or euros or whatever back to 1990 versus today's costs, but they were billing out my hourly rate at $700 US an hour. That would have been massive back then. Yeah, it was huge. And, and, and we weren't quite able to pay the bills. Oh so, my God. So what they decided to do was another big pivot. 
was they came to me and they said, we are going to see if we can uh, basically invent the idea of doing photo retouching digitally for automotive. Because the automotive, uh, there was, there was a, um, that was already an industry uh, in the Detroit area for photo retouching um, for automotive advertising. Like it had been done since they, they went to photography. Like I said, they went to photography in the early 1960s. So when they call it retouching, it was actually touching because they would make these big prints that were, they were big, big prints, like two or three feet across by whatever, uh, for even for an ad that was going to be this big, they would print the car, a big print of it, you know, so it's upsize. And the artists would go in. I, I didn't do any of this type of work, but they could take bleach and they could bleach out parts of the photograph on, on a print, not, not, on, not on film, on a print, and then go back in with dyes, which was the same type of dyes that would sort of be in the photo itself, and airbrush or paint or whatever in there and retouch. That's why it's called retouching uh, the pictures. And they would clean them up. Mind blowing! Like to think how that has mm-hmm. changed. That's mind blowing. Well, well people were retouched too. I mean, sure, in like in oh New York God. and things like that. There was probably an industry of retouching, you know, for fashion and things like that. But yeah. in the Detroit area, it was it was cleaning up pictures of of the cars, you know, and yeah. making them perfect and hit, adding reflections and nice shine and stuff like that. Um, so the idea was okay. We can use this technology we have in 1990, 1991, I guess at that time but we have to get the photography into the computer somehow. Now I could, I could go on and tell you all about this stuff for, for hours, but <laughs> so it was a challenge to get the film scanned. Um, the scanning technology at the time, there was scanning technology, but what they would do is they would scan either scan the film to go to the printing press or scan those, um, those big prints that were retouched. Um, back into, but they were scanning. They were scanning to go into four. Like again, it's a long conversation. Pictures on a computer are RGB. I mean, you probably know that, right? Red, green, and blue. Yep. They're lights for the your monitor. But for printing on a, on paper, you need four colors. You need cyan, magenta, yellow, and a black plate. Hmm. So when they would scan, it would go straight to the four color separations to make the make the plates for the printing press. Now, because going back, <laughs> back to high school, <clears throat> I knew a little bit about making, you know, printing plates and stuff. So I was kind of thinking, well, I, I, know, I know what they're doing, and I know a bit about digital art now, and I know that digital art on the computer is RGB, and I know that they need to make CMYK, CIN, magenta, yellow, and black plates to go to print. So I kind of, you, you know what I'm saying? So you're, you call this the journey, and it's like, that stuff we take all those things that we've learned and it's like it's amazing you can pull the stuff out of the archives and go like i remember making printing plates when i was 18 years old you know um and what this how this stuff sort of works and so um they finally came up there were some companies that were working on getting scans that could could output to rgb and so i i it, i know this probably to some people this is just sounds like crazy stuff but Anything in technology, there was a time when it wasn't until it, when it was, right? Yep. And so it was like, why would you ever need to, why would you need a, you know, to scan a photo and to bring it into a computer? It was like, why are you even arguing about this? It's like, because this is when we need to work on these pictures. So anyway, like I said, that was a long conversation. But so we get into um, getting the scans and then we, we get into, uh, uh, retouching the pictures, which we could do because we were already doing the artwork on the computer on the big, yeah. that big mainframe computer. We were doing it. So it, instead of starting with nothing and just doing an illustration, we could il- do an illustration, which is what retouching is doing illustrating on the photos, the digitized photos files, right? Just another quick <laughs> thing <laughs> to tell you how old I am. So at the end of my shift and working on the computer, cause we had a computer, um, one computer, we had three artists, I'm American, so I use these fingers. Um, three artists at 24 hours in a day. So we had three artists each working an eight-hour shift. 
on one computer. Okay, so at the end of my shift, before the end of my shift, I would have to back up, I would have to export any of the files that were in the computer onto magnetic tape. We had, it was half inch wide, 2,600 feet long tapes that were on spools about this big. Um, and back up all my stuff and get it off the computer so that the next artist could come in, load his job tapes, and he had to run the tape and, and, and load those files that he was working on into the computer so he could do his shift. Oh, his my work. God. I, it was just, yeah, it was, a, it was, it was just crazy because there was no memory. The, the, the no. memory was all it was with RAM. They called it a, a frame store. It was just the storage enough for one picture. You couldn't have two pictures open at one time. There was a buffer for the picture. And if you brought in another picture, it overwrote the picture that was already in there. <laughs> and um, how, yeah, how about that? times changed, man. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> it was crazy. <laughs> so if, this, if, if people are fascinated, I, I'll, I'll, I'll continue with this. I'm, I'm not sure if they are or not. Some people may or may not be. Um, <laughs> but so once we did the, 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 the photo retouching on the car, we would have the client come in, look at it on the monitor to, you know, to approve it and whether I did, the, did all the changes to the car. Sometimes it needed different wheels, pieces on there. Sometimes the, the paint was the wrong color. Maybe they photographed the car in red and they weren't going to launch it red. They wanted it to be in blue. So we would change, you know, paint, paint colors and things like that. Um, but then we had to get the file back out of the computer and get it to the, uh, the, the printing company that was going to, you know, do the printing, whether it was printing the advertising or if it was printing for the car brochures, uh, things like that. And so back to the people that I was arguing with in the first place doing the scanning, um, they had no way of, their system wouldn't take an RGB file. Like you couldn't give it a file. What it, what it needed was it needed to make, it needed to scan something in order to make the printing plates. Uh, we couldn't, there was no such thing as transferring the file. That just so seems so another, archaic. I know. Oh so another technology was invented where we could write the RGB file back out to film again. Okay, and this film isn't negative film. It's positive film. It's like if you ever remember the little slides. Yeah, These yeah. slides were yep. eight inches by 10 inches. Yeah. Okay, and that's how the photographers would, would photograph them, by the way. They would photograph them on eight inch by 10 inch film, on a, the big cameras with the big bellows. Yep. And so we would go back out to film again. That film would have to get approved by the ad agency and by the, by the automotive client. And then and they would look at it with a loop, with like a you know, magnifier loop. And they'd go through it and check it out, you know, and if it was all, looked all good, it, then it would go to the printing house or the scanning house to go to the, which is called pre-press, the pre-press, you know, prep for press for printing. Um, and then they would scan the, that, and they would scan that piece of film and then make the printing plates from it from there. So those pictures, by the time they got from the photographer through us, through all those processes and back out to being printed, it was just a miracle by the time that if it had any fidelity left to it. Because it had, because they were degraded. You know, every step yeah, was yeah, degrading course. it. Because it wasn't like you were taking the digital. Like now, if we take a picture, those pixels that are captured, like even on our phone, those that that light actually hits the the sensor in the camera, right? It makes a pixel, and if I transfer that pixel, that pixel, that raster of pixels to you, they're just as original on your phone than as it is on my phone. Yep. There's no, there's no loss. And well, unless, unless there, you know, there was some compression unless or something like that happened. Yep. Right. But so when that process that I just described to you, I mean, there was loss several times, mm. you know, so we really, we would get to the end of it. And sometimes there was clients, you know, being critical of like, well, how come this doesn't look as vivid or as sharp as that original film, you know? And, um, Again, to answer that question for them, I needed to know what I was talking about, you know, because they wanted to know, like, and by the time I got done explaining it, it was like, wh okay, whatever. Okay, <laughs> yeah, they got a headache. <laughs> okay, I believe you. Okay, just stop <laughs> talking, okay? Um, and then, uh, yeah. So at that point, um, you know, I guess 
if there was any part of my career that I, that I probably felt less creative, it, it probably was that, that time, you know, that it was, uh, um, cause it was, it was pretty grueling, you know, and it was really just following instructions, you know, pretty much. I mean, I, I did get to solve some problems in there, but, um, but again, you know, it's like, what's the balance? You know, it's like, I, I was, um, not, I'm not knowing it really at the time, but when it, I was doing that work, there was only one studio and they were in Texas somewhere that had another computer that was the same computer that we had. So there were only two computers because it was from England. It was that Quantel company hmm. that were in the United States that were doing automotive um, auto retouching work. So we were only one of two companies. So it was one of those times, you know, but, um, where you could but, make you know, the most get, of the of the chance you had, right? So. Yeah, and those don't, those times don't last don't last forever. You know, that you get uh, you get competition coming in, and then machines get cheaper. And again, as those years went by, uh, personal computers, you know, Macintosh and PC, you know, Windows machines, got more powerful, had more more um, um, memory storage, faster processors. Um, at that time, you know, Photoshop kept coming up. You know, Photoshop, you know, 1.0, 2.0, 3.0. Um, kept advancing um and uh so is that too much detail justin Are, is, is this i'm gonna i'm gonna jump in there because <laughs> you know I, I don't want everyone to miss out on this journey like so, yeah, yeah yeah you know you knowing that i heard a lot of your story you know you've you pivot you've pivoted many times within the same industry creative industry photography scanning whole heap of stuff then comes someone along from the automotive industry asking if you can turn the turn the CAD production files into actual images that you could yes. use advertising. And that seems to be like really where we drag in CAD and, you know, that sort of things into what you've sort of gotten into now uh, yes. and what you're more known for now. So I thought we'd uh, skip a little bit over that although that's super interesting and amazing um, and sort of talk about uh, the 3d printing and the CNC work and, and that sort of stuff that you do more, more. Now. Yeah. I mean, that would have been 15 for 15 years ago. Yeah, I guess. So, so I've been working on CAD like product CAD stuff for the last 15 years, hmm. um, and, you know, and, and doing that that part of it. And then, like I said, doing the photorealistic renderings. Um, and, uh, then, um, also, so you, you wanted me, and that's that was uh, supposed to be a small step. <laughs> so <laughs> getting it. into what I'm doing now though, yeah, let's do that. Uh, let's the do. biggest thing was that I had all this CAD data. I had whole cars. Okay. But my output was two dimensional. I was going out to a picture of something that was this immense three-dimensional object that I could go inside of it. I could zoom inside the, I could be under the seats. I could have all this stuff and I'd get this picture, this 2D thing. And as my CAD skills um, got better, I started modeling, you know, my own parts and things like that. And then I was, but I was still stuck in this 2D world of like, okay, I'm going to do a, a rendering of it. You know, oh, I'll do a rendering of this side of it. And then I'll do a rendering of this side of it. And I'm like, but this is, this is 3D. This is 3D. So that was 2010 um, is when we were at the Detroit Maker Fair, Maker Fair Detroit. Uh, we actually met Bree Pettis, who is one of the founders, the most famous founder of MakerBot. Um, my son was there too. He's, of course, he was at the, I forget what, what age he would have been. Um, when he was probably 10, 11 years old. Um, my daughter was younger. She was probably a little too young to be interested in that stuff. She is interested in now. Um, but uh, so we, we still have that MakerBot. We bought, we bought a MakerBot, which would have been either 2010 or 2011. So it's a wooden, one of the wooden ones. It's not the first generation, the one they call a cupcake, mm. but it's the one after that, the one that's called a Thingomatic. It's this wooden, little wooden kit, the bill plates on it, it's like this big. But we built it and I was able to, I, I can't even describe that moment of that taking something I designed in CAD and actually seeing it and think of it again. This is 2010, 2011, right? It's almost 10 years ago. 
of <laughs> you know, like holding this in my hand, right? Like, like, you know, and, and people do that now, you know, when they get a 3D printer, their first 3D printer, they're like, I drew this up in, in my computer and now I can hold it in my hand, you know, like whatever it is. And, you know, I was just fascinated with that. So That's exactly that, what that happened to into, me. I was like, yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Like, all of I was like, oh my God, my world has changed. Like I didn't, like I've said before in other podcasts, like I thought it was cheating. Like I honestly thought, like really pretty, cheating. Yeah, like I had this, <laughs> I had this perception that, like, oh, you just draw it in the thing and then you press play and then off you go. Like, <laughs> but when 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 I made the remote for the sofa beer fridge, and yeah. you know, like I didn't know how to do any CAD drawings or, or like Fusion three hundred and sixty, so I, I went to my friend Jürgen's place. He helped me draw it all up, and then we we press print, and then you know, to have it in your hands and like see that it actually fits and all the things, all the cavities and all the shapes that you designed in the computer actually came out how you wanted it to. It just, yeah. you know, like it blew my mind. So I definitely, I, I could feel that for like, and imagine what it was like 10 years ago, like when this stuff was so new to everyone. Well, yeah, because right now, like when, if you do that right now, you know, you show that to a couple of your friends and they're like, yeah, yeah, beginner. <laughs> but, but back then when nobody had seen that, they're like, wait, wait what? what? <laughs> yeah. Did, wait, wait, what is, this is, yeah, yeah, so, right. So, but that led me very quickly into, I think within the same year of building a CNC router machine. And I went online and I found a, a couple of people that were doing DIY um, router machines, CNC routers. And so I had a bunch of scrap wood. We had just recently built our house and uh, I had a bunch of scrap, had all piles of scrap lumber. And so I built a wooden uh, CNC router machine that only cut um, to 12 inches by 12 inches, I think, or maybe it went travel that far and it, it would cut 11 inches by 11 inches, something like that. Um, and I built it from, uh, you know, plan, well, sort of from plans online. Um, uh, just, you know, went and bought the motors separate. I had uh, the electronics, the controller box. Um, I built it out of an old PC carcass. Um, you know, bought the, uh, the motor drivers, power supply, things like that. From, just from online, you know, from, from online instructions. And uh, wired it all up and uh, had it working. I did a couple of carvings of some signs for my, uh, my son's Cub Scout. Uh, pack, uh, you know, and really got my got my uh, feet wet into into CNC, you know. But at the time too, I you know, you start looking at all that stuff. Probably emerged right about the same time, like consumer level um, laser laser machines, laser engraver machines, um, vinyl cutters. They're, they're all actually CNC, you know. They they mm -hmm. are. Um, uh, you know, that type of thing. So I just really got uh, interested in it. And then I think, so we were at Maker Faire 2010 and I knew about Maker Faire because as a family, we were subscribed to Make Magazine. Uh, so we would have had a subscription before then. So we may have had our subscription, you know, for, from like maybe 09 or 08 or something like that in the magazine so in make magazine is also credited with founding the maker community um thanks make and uh, so that, <laughs> yeah yeah well as we, you know we i think we, we talked in the pre-show too about um jimmy duresta had worked for make magazine uh mm. i think back then i i think back then i think he he was actually doing I, now i had i wasn't doing anything with them we were just using it as a a project, a source for, you know, a publication that we would get as a family, you know, that had projects in it for the, our family, for the kids and things like that. Yeah. Um, and uh, I didn't know, didn't know, uh, didn't know of Jimmy at the time, but, uh, but yeah, so I think he was, um, he was work. I, I don't know the exact year, but I know that he would have had a, he may have been in some of those magazines. <laughs> I didn't even know who he was you know, at the time. So make magazine. Yeah. It was a foundation for, um, for a lot of the things that you can, you can probably tie back quite a few things. Um, you know, back to uh, back to make the maker maker movement that they. Uh, they started. I want to I want to jump in here because you weren't you yeah. weren't just like 2010. 
you know, like you got into like making things with your hands, right? You were doing all this crazy stuff with all this digital retouching and like scanning and like starting seven, 20, 30, 50 businesses and all that <laughs> stuff that was <laughs> going on. Right. <laughs> and constantly pivoting. And you were, you were still making things, weren't you? You were making lamps weren't you? at some point. Well, I did. In fact, I, when I said I incorporated my company in 1993, I incorporated to make lamps. I was making I was fascinated with mid-century modern design, especially some of the stuff that was going on in Italy. Um, I mean, I, as I, if I would have gone to school for anything, as a secondary choice would have been architecture um, and furniture design, the types of light, and specifically lighting. So I was, was just a fanatic about lighting. So I did do some lamp designs. I had some lamp designs. I set it back again to the fine art. So <laughs> interesting because we, we were talking in the pre-show about this. Uh, I was always was fascinated with functional art. So my art in the form of a light would be something like, okay, it's my art, but also somebody can use it. Like it's functional. It's a light that, that would light their house or whatever. Yeah, so, but there was fine art in this sense that I wasn't doing it for somebody. I did some lamps. They were my designs. And I had them in, uh, there was two galleries. One of the galleries was in um, Michigan, but another one was in Chicago. Um, that I actually had some lamps and get in galleries, you know. So, and that was back. Well, I said, like I said, ninety. So that would have been ninety one, ninety two. And then when I decided to actually sell them, somebody had recommended. They said, "Well, you know, th that's an electric thing. You're selling a piece of art, but somebody's going to plug that in their wall. You know, is it going to get hot? Is it going to catch on fire? Of course, lamps always catch on fire, right? I mean, they just they just burst into flames when you plug them in." <laughs> so uh yeah, well you know right my my mom it's gonna burn somebody's house down anyway yeah. so that's why we incorporated anyway that's why i incorporated because that's you know corporate if you have you run a business through a corporation at least it gives you a little bit of protection as an individual that if something does go wrong um not not that you still can't you know get in trouble but i, I wasn't trying to do <laughs> things that were dangerous or illegal it was just like that's just like the smart thing to do but oh and this, this, this does tie you into later too, but some of the followers might have seen this online. I think a so lot this of is, people, you got to explain what that is. Cause I okay. It is an, it's an electric motor. That's, it's an electric motor. Okay. Amazing. So if I, if I hook up to, to the wire here, if I hook up uh, 12 volts to this, which I won't do right now, um, this will spin. It's, it, it's a little model of a, a motor, okay? So it's on this piece of plywood. I, I built this when I was 14 years old. Okay, so that was 43 years ago. <laughs> I, I just found it like, like a year or two ago. Um, and I actually put it online. So if you look at my Instagram, or actually that blew up on TikTok. I've got over 3 million views of me running that on TikTok because some people thought that it was an energy generator. <laughs> so funny, I said like, it was oh a motor, but, but again, that, that's okay, a so failure of our education <laughs> system, Bernie. Yeah, I know. <laughs> we got people thinking it's a generator. So this, okay. So I, I just think that if you want to say, see anything, that's like, like a full circle thing is that I did that when I was 14 out of, a, out of a book, it was a book from the library that explained how electric motors worked. And I just lo always loved gadgets. Now, I, I'm building a new electric motor that hopefully this later this year, or this fall, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to introduce that. So there'll be a YouTube video on it. And hopefully, I'm going to be able to um, make some kits that'll be for sale. Like you could get by the kit and you could put it together and have yourself an electric motor that'll run. And you can, you know, it's, it's a great thing for you know, well, for anybody, I'm still fascinated with it at my age. But I mean, for kids, you know, to be able to build something and you hook it up. And I'm also going to make it so that it plugs into um, a USB power supply. So five, five volts. I wouldn't suggest plugging like the laptop, but I mean, like to a, um, you know, like a phone charger, yeah, little phone yeah. charger bricks, they all put five volts. And I'm going to make it so that you can plug it in that way, or you can have a little battery pack that it runs off of. That'd um, be super fun. And that, uh, yeah, and that's never, it's that old and it's, it's never caught on fire. So, but uh, I, I will still be selling it through my corporation. Though. <laughs> but, but that's, I think that that's kind of a big 
you were talking about, you know, being into building things and stuff for a long time. So um, as far as being a, a, a maker, a, a building things and gadgets, like goes back to, I, I actually have that as evidence. Okay. So yeah. that, that's, I, 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 I have I done other things, up, but that, I want to bring that's, up that's the things. one I'm touching. Yeah, go ahead. The two things I want to bring up. One, I think you're a cheat <laughs> and you shouldn't have won the lightness challenge because you've been making <laughs> lamps before. So <laughs> I think <laughs> like, I think Vincent busted. Really <laughs> okay, edit this out. <laughs> but, oh, so a lamp designer, a lamp designer. <laughs> I think Vincent should open this up again. What do they I call think. that? Hustling? Did I hustle? Did I hustle Vincent and Ethan? Uh, but besides that, the second thing I wanted to say is like, I think a lot of people, if they took a snapshot of you, they were like, oh, look at Bernie. He's got like all these toys and he makes all this fun stuff. And like, it's nice to be him and, you know, got all this stuff. But I think hearing like this insane long journey of jumping, pivoting, you know, business starting up, you know, uh, yeah. education in artwork and staying true to what you actually know and like to do. I mean, this is a 40 year journey. This is not something that happened overnight where you can put yourself in the position to then start doing all this making and showing people what you can actually do. So I, I've, I take that away yeah. from your journey. I, I really do. I, I think there's, there's no shortcut to where you've done, you've done it. You've done definitely the long way around. Um, but I mean, I think in no, everything, but the thing you, is, is in everything you learned right along the way made you where you are. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. But again, to back up again, and I don't want, I, if there was anything that I, the, you said takeaway, you just mentioned something a second ago. That's right. I'm sorry. I'm glad you didn't let me interrupt you. But <laughs> I was just thinking that that the um, uh, as far as as yeah, I, I, I'm here to. I, I want to give a, a positive impression and give people energy and inspiration to to, to do things, and to not say that you have to be doing it for 40 years before it feels good. You know, it felt good to me. All the time, I, it felt I, 14 years old when I built this. I felt good about what I was doing. It wasn't like I felt like I wasn't accomplishing anything, or there was, you know, like I had to wait for something. You know, it wasn't like like that. And again, and yeah. So it was a takeaway. Now, whether that just disqualifies me for the contest or not, <laughs> I'm but, just joking, man. <laughs> well, no, but again, you know, it, it somebody. I'm not out to make people, not like I can make somebody feel bad, but it's like, yeah, I went to art school. I've studied, I actually studied lighting design for a long time. And it just so happened that that was their challenge. If they had a challenge in, in, in welding, <laughs> I wouldn't even have entered. No, exactly, I mean, you know, right. you know what I mean? So yeah. it just happened that that was it. And I actually contemplated doing that. And I was just thinking, you know, I, I've been friends with um, with Vincent and Ethan for a long time, you know, and uh, they were asking me about, you know, if I was going to do something for the challenge. And I thought that'd be a lot of fun to do that. So, um, they yeah, also so I, so know, I jumped they in They also there know your journey, and, man. They, they chose to well, make you the winner. So, you know. Look I how think, things fall, though. I'm, here I'm building this, I'm building this uh, CNC circular saw. And the company who, which is, um, is it Dukta Dukta in Switzerland? Um, they actually came up with this whole incision plywood, flexible plywood thing. Like mm. I, I, there's other companies that make different types of pattern plywoods and things like that for architectural panel purposes and things like that. But those guys had come up with that way of like slicing up the plywood with circular saw uh, to make that flexible panel. And they had actually contacted me when they saw me doing it. And they said, hey, you know, we've got a patent on this thing and we make these four by eight sheets of this stuff. And if you, you know, if anybody wants any these big panels or whatever, would you please refer them to us? And I said, yeah, that's, that, that's fine. I'm not going to be making four by eight sheets of sliced up, you know, plywood. I, that mm -hmm. wasn't my intention. And so I thought at the time, I thought, you know what? At the moment, all I was doing was emulating them 
you know, because they make these four by eight sheets of, I don't think they're four by eight or they're five by 10 or whatever they are. Then they're all just cut the same. Yeah. And they had done some lamp designs where they had cut a piece of their plywood. They, they cut it out of a sheet and they, and they wrapped it around something. And they made some sconces, I think, or a couple of lights that were like tubular. And I thought, I really like lamps. This is before, this is before the, the, I was really thinking about the challenge thing. And I thought, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to just be, well, copying, you learn a lot by copying people, right? Yeah, yeah. You, you can learn a lot. I, I was trained that way in school even. And so I thought, how do I make this my own thing? So I saw what they were doing and I thought, well, they're cutting a piece of their plywood out of a sheet of their plywood and they're rolling it up in a cylinder. It's like, well, what if I were to make a lampshade that was its own design? Like, like I would cut the lampshade, but cut it with the CNC circular saw specifically for that lampshade. It wasn't going to be a piece of a panel of something else. Like, oh, mm-hmm. you know, here's a, here's a product. I'm going to cut it up and, you know, make something else out of it. It was literally going to be my own. So the, the way the cuts are made are my own, the geometry, um, the whole thing, I kind of embraced it to make it my own. And also, like I said, for them, the, like I said, they contacted me like, oh, you're doing what we're doing type of thing, which was like, yeah, yeah I, I am. And I had credited them right from the beginning. But I just thought, well, you know, where can I take it, you know, type of a thing. So that, and then when the lamp challenge came up, I mean, it, it just all kind of fell together. So does that make, sort of make sense? The, I mean, good always, <laughs> like, the good ideas always do just fall together. Like right now, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm contemplating building a reverse swimming pool. And yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The, right. good, the good idea, you know, is like it's all coming together. In my head, it works, right? So I just got to get the time mm-hmm. in the shop to make it happen. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to get in the shop. Like I literally got that sofa beer fridge back to its owner today. I took it, took for another freaking drive up there, delivered it back again after the, the national news had been down. Cause I, that's why I had to bring it back again. And, yeah. uh, you know, and so <laughs> I've, I said to, uh, to my wife, I'm like, I just so bloody happier now. Cause I got, maybe the potential to to get my hands on a new project you know like and i think that all everything lines up always when when you when it's supposed to i guess you should say yeah 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 it does and fit yeah yeah and i mean I, considering, I just, considering like you know like companies like you were mimicking you know and that sort of yeah. thing you know you got inspiration from them is I thought you know that would be a good segue into Inspiration Nation. Yeah, yeah. Inspiration Nation. Uh, 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 uh. Is there any everyday okay. creative heroes that you you want to give a shout out to? Yes, I do. Um uh well, in general, I'm inspired every day by my my, my immediate family. Um, my uh, my wife, she's I say she's my hero. She's a cancer survivor. She's just an incredible woman, and she does all kinds of uh, creative things. Um, my son, who's just about to turn 21 years old, I so he inspires me because he's such a free spirit, and he has the ability to pivot way easier than I do, which is an inspiration. Because I, I mean, you, I've told you my story. I, I've pivoted quite a bit, but he's just like, I don't know. I don't know if he got it from me or whatever, but he's just like, oh, whatever. Because he started college and he just decided that's not what I want to do. I'm gonna, just going to take some time and figure out what I want to do. And it, so that's inspiring to me for somebody that can just be like, oh, you know, I'm just going to whatever. And then um, my daughter specifically, um, she uh, is going to be going to school. She just finished high school. Is going to be going to school to um, be a school teacher. She wants to. She wants to teach, uh, and she's also quite an artist. Uh, so specifically, shout out uh, inspiration to her. She has her um, online identity is theoretical space. 
She has a brand new website that's just getting put together. That's theoreticalspace.com. And she's at theoretical at theoretical space on Instagram. And she also has a new Etsy shop that she's starting to sell some of her art on. So, um, you know, if there's a shout out like an online creative uh, person, then uh, she's she's the one that's online. My son and my wife are not quite uh, online, but they they do still inspire me. So, I have family, and then like I said, with her. So uh, her name is uh, is Haley, also, which it, and that's on her. That's on her Instagram. So theoretical space. There's nothing like so a family check, shout check out. out. <laughs> yeah, check it. Check out. Check out her. Uh, her, uh, her Etsy shop, especially, she's just, um, I just, she just gl- starts glowing when somebody, uh, you know, buys something. And the way we're living these days, I mean, she's selling stuff to like other parts of the world, you know. So she's just like, wow, somebody from, you know, wherever just bought something from me. So, yeah, it's really cool to see her do that. So it's very inspiring. It's great. I will make sure that all the links are in the show notes, guys. Um, let's just jump straight into Hack Attack. This is Hack Attack! I will not apologize for this bad intro. Any tips or tricks you want to share with the audience? Um, I would say it, it probably it's, it's big and it's small at the same time. Uh, to just to, to be observant, I think it's something that's probably helped me through my whole journey is to, um, to just look at things around us all the time. Um, if you really want to practice being observant, a, a really good test is when you think things are going wrong, look at why you're, you're there, like where, wherever you're at. Like, uh, so as a, an analogy or an example of that is like, um, uh, say you're out for a drive or you're or even better, you're driving somewhere and you're on a schedule. Like you're supposed to be somewhere, right, for an appointment, a business meeting or whatever, and you take a wrong turn, okay? It can be very frustrating, right, because you're already running late maybe and you take a wrong turn. That if you take just a second and you're like, you know, like where am I? You might just in that few seconds, you might see something. You might see some, uh, something going on with a person. You might see a sign. You might see something you might see a contraption an object a, a machine or um i don't know a use of color or something like that that might just you might just see it right as you're trying to get back on the road as you're trying to turn around and get yourself back where you were going like it can do several things right i mean it can give you it can inspire you for something you might want to make a note of it whatever it was or it could also take a little bit of the pressure off of the stress of the fact that you think you were making a mistake but it wasn't a mistake because you were there. In the extreme case, if you were to make a wrong turn and you were to say, get off a road and you, as you're trying to turn yourself around, you might find a person on the side of the road that is having car trouble. That if you would have been going straight and you wouldn't have gotten off there, you may be able to help that person. You know, like that, that may be why you were there. Maybe, you know, this is starting to get a little bit, <laughs> you know, universal here but i mean it, that stuff happens it yeah, really things, does it's like why was i reason, there right? you know yeah like there may be a a a, a, a a you know a person that is there and they, they don't know maybe they don't know how to change their flat tire on their car you know and they have a child or they've got you know something like that and you can spend a few minutes help them out get back on the road and if somebody gives you shit when you get to wherever you're going because you were late like really like, look, this is what happened. Okay. It's like, oh, well, okay, well then fine. You know, you weren't just, <laughs> you weren't just sleeping in. Right. I mean, you actually stopped and helped somebody. Yeah. You know? well, and I didn't stop and help somebody. No, I took a wrong turn and it turns out that there was somebody there that needed my help, you know? <laughs> yeah. So uh, you could end up with that. We had a, um, you mentioned robotics earlier in the intro. There was a guy, a guy laughed, but he, but he laughed, but then he was like, wait a second. We were, we were working on a robot for the robotics team. Hmm. And this fella, uh, we solved a problem with the robot and there was this joint. We were, we were working on something that had this pivot, we were using the word pivot a lot, um, that we had to make this part move. And uh, the guy was, he said, by the way, how did you, how did you guys come up with that, 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 that pivot, how that, that pivot worked? And I said, you really want to know? And he said, yeah, that, cause that's a great, it's a great idea where it worked out. Right. I said, well, I was in the bathroom stall looking at the hinge on the door 
I love like, this. I love this. Right? Oh, so I mean, good. it was like, well, there you go, right? It's like you're sitting, you're like taking a break, basically. And you're like, oh, that might work. <laughs> you know okay. what? This, this happened in the sofa beer fridge, too. Like, I hit a wall. I like, yeah, like, yeah. I didn't know what to do. Like, I had this, like, the original design had, like, this ramp style thing with, like, a pivoting, like, um, I don't know, like a, a gate kind of thing that yeah. let the one beer at a time come out. And, you know, I, I was dead set on that idea. And then I was mocking it up all in cardboard and realized I could only get seven beers in this fridge because of the height restriction on it. I'm like, what, what f- sofa beer fridge only holds seven beers? This is ridiculous. So, you know, I, I decided I'd get out of there and I went for a, I went for a bit of a walk. It was snowing and pretty bad weather. Um, and then I just happened to be walking to an area where there's like a, like a toboggan hill where they do all like the sledding and stuff. And there was a guy on his snowmobile driving up and down, like flattening it out. And he stopped for just you know, a couple of minutes. And I happened to walk mm-hmm. past that snowmobile and looked at the track on the back of the snowmobile. And I was mm-hmm. like, that's it. That's how I'm going to solve the problem. And literally that was just the same day where I was like, I don't know where to go and what to do with this, like how to fix this. And then mm-hmm. yeah, I took, took myself out of that environment, went and opened my eyes and I saw the solution. So yeah, it was, I mean, yeah. things like that happen all the time actually. And for, for, for makers, you know, who are, who are, you know, building objects and things that move maybe, or, you know, things that are connect together. Um, I've heard other makers say the same thing. Like if you want to, if you want to do it on purpose, go to a, uh, go, you know, go to a hardware store or go to a tool store or go, go to someplace like that where you're, you're surrounded by these, all these little parts, you know, and the fasteners and connectors and things mm. like that and bearings and bushings and shafts and, you know, all that stuff um, that, uh, that, that could just get, you know what I mean? You can start like, um, uh, the plumbing department, especially with things that fit together. If, if you're trying to like make something, if you go to the plumbing department, everything is meant to screw together, you know, and they're different sizes and there's insides and outsides and of the threads and, and uh, ID and OD of the parts and the tubes and all that stuff. Um, or the electrical department or, you know, any of that stuff. Like I said, if you wanted to actually do it on purpose, but my, I guess my, my hack attack tip would be just, you know, be, be a trained observer. Just, just practice, practice being aware of what you're around. Oh, I got to add one other thing to that. I was talking about man-made things. Yeah. You want to, you want to really blow your mind without, without any substances nature <laughs> yeah right nature nature has so much more than anything that's that's designed by humans especially when you take a close look at nature right like a, oh yeah a close look at something yeah things are built they're made by whatever the powers that be but like the fibonacci sequence and stuff like with um like sunflowers the way that the seeds grow and like uh snail shells you know the the spiral mm. i mean it's it's actually math yeah. You know, cause we didn't, we didn't invent math. Math is, math was here when we got here, you know, um, we just sort of discovered it. It wasn't an invention. So, you know, when things like go, things go together and then with nature, there, there's the math, but then there's the, um, the discrepancies in it. Like the, it, it, like, like it's like where it's broken. It's not broken where it's not perfect type of a thing. Yeah. You know, do, do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like, it, there's, there's like, like a snail shell yeah. is is mathematically designed, but it's not perfect. Like there's there's the imperfection built into to all of it. Like it follows the math, but it's not really there. I think it's because we try and put numbers on it. I mean, this is getting <laughs> this is getting pretty distant. But I always say, if you really want a good example of what I'm talking about, is uh, you, you know, pi yeah. math, right? It's a it's a proportion. Of a circle, right? I mean, that's how we figure out circles. Yep. But the re- there's a reason that it's a symbol. It's not a number. That, 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 it, that's why it's a symbol. Because it's not a number. 
this, this is my own, this is my own math here because I'm not a math guy. <laughs> but, but there's a reason that, that's why when, you know, people try and figure out like how far you can take pi, like in the decimals, it, it's not perfect because it's not a number. It's a symbol. It's like a, it's a proportion that you can't, that doesn't have a number. Is that, is that too far out there? <laughs> I'm not smoking or drinking anything, <laughs> but I'm just saying. I never it, accuse it is, you of anything, Bertie. I... It, it is what it is. I'm <laughs> drinking water. I really am. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that stuff can be just really magical. So, I mean, if you just take the simplest things, I mean, sometimes, you know, like you found out with the snowmobile track. I mean, you were actually trying to, you were trying to, who knows what you were trying to do at the time, but you were, yeah. you were trying to maybe clear your head and, and yeah, clear was, head. Yeah. It was. A clear head is where the things come in, right? That's where the creativity is in, in a clear head. If you're thinking all the time, I, I, th- I find that I'm not creative when I'm thinking. <laughs> yeah, like when, you know? when I was talking to Jake, the Maker Monster, you know, a long time ago, I, I don't know, remember what episode that was, but, you know, um, he says the same thing, you know, like get away, like walk away from the problem clear your head and you'll find the solution that always seems to happen for me as well. So yeah, I love it. Yeah. Well, that's what you did with the snowmobile. You found the solution. You, you could take credit for it, but you found it. Yeah. Like, I, mean, like you I, didn't, I didn't, you didn't invent, sit down there and derive it. You, no. you went, Oh, that's my answer right there. Right. So yeah. it's, yeah, uh, it's, it's interesting. It's like the book still like an artist. You know, that's yeah. the premise of it. You know, you go out and you find what other people are doing. You take little elements and you like smoosh them together with your elements and other people's elements. And, and then you've got a new complete thing. People are like, oh, how did you come up with that miraculous idea? <laughs> well, actually, <laughs> it's about 10 people's ideas smooshed together. <laughs> you know, so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, I mean, we all do that as creatives, I think. Yeah, and it, it but it, it can be easy and it can be very difficult all at the same time. I know, not, I always find that the stuff that's easy was meant to be. The stuff that's hard is not meant to be. So <laughs> maybe I should have given up on the sofa beer fridge a long time ago. <laughs> 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 oh, it's finished now, so it's good, guys. Uh, just a reminder: uh, part three is out now. If you want to go check it out, people's. <laughs> yeah, go um, check it out. Yeah. Um, let's go into rapid five five. Hey, what are you looking at? Get up and dance. This is the rapid five five. Oh boy, how fast? We gotta go fast, right? Well, we can go as fast as you want. Let's just keep it as quick as <laughs> but this I'm podcast, not fast at all. This podcast is going a while. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have my watch on. Okay. <laughs> I agree. Just let me talk. All right, here we go. Yeah, I'm, re- I'm ready. Okay. Fill in the blank. Creativity is? Uh, let's see. I made a few notes here because I knew, I knew you were going to hit me with this. Um, I, I think it, it, it's what you just said with the snowmobile thing. I think, it's, uh, I think creativity is us being a, a conduit or a, connect, a, a connection between what it, what it isn't and what it becomes. So we're the, we're the one that connects it. Like you connected the snowmobile track to the beer fridge so that's your that's that's creativity what is something that people get wrong about you um uh probably the uh like what what it takes what it takes to if, if there was anything that they were thinking that i either had a skill or anything like that that it that it came easy <laughs> There were some pretty painful times of going through uh, what I've gone through to get to um, where I'm at. So, yeah, but it was good. I mean, it was all a good journey. It was all growth. At at the time, it it felt painful. But, yeah, so, yeah, so that it, it, I spent a lot of time uh, doing things, learning things. Yeah, I mean, that's true for a lot of us that, you know, seem to be very good at what we do is, you know, people think it came like, naturally or instantaneously and it's often not the case so yeah i think it's cool um what's what's your favorite thing to do when you're not being creative um i i think uh sharing sharing experiences especially with the immediate family like especially like at meals and things 
my wife is she's just amazing she she well i say she likes to cook sometimes she says she doesn't like to cook as much but she is a really good she's a really good cook and she has uh been an awesome mother wife uh um she's just feels really responsible for like you know feeding <laughs> feeding us she grows a garden and uh uh makes meals a lot at times so we get to sit together um during meals and i think i think spending family time in, in sharing stories and listening to what everybody else is going through and understanding uh, why, you know, like, like I said, we have got two young adults, my wife and I, plus the two young or kids are young adults now. So everybody's got a little drama in their day, you know, and sometimes it helps to, to, to ask why, you know, why, like, is it, you know, it, or, or it's a good day, you know, like what happened good today, you know, or what is it that you might be struggling with, you know, type of things like that. So but she is sharing, sharing each other's journeys, you know, especially with immediate family. So like that's my fast answer for that one. <laughs> The close family time is always good. I think like I also, I need to sometimes schedule it in so that, you know, I get that time, uh, especially yeah. around the, around the table and stuff. So that's yeah, good. Um, what is a project that is completely priceless to you uh, that you could never sell? Oh, it, it's gotta be, it's gotta be this. That's because it's probably the only thing that I have of that I that of my maker journey. I think that if I were to, yeah, that I can't, I can't, I can't let go of that. In yeah. fact, I thought I lost it and then I found it again. So Bernie was holding up his uh, handmade. Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. My motor, motor, my electric motor that I yeah. built when I was a kid. Yeah, that's it. And um, here's the last question: What does happiness look like? Um. You know, I think that uh, that's a tough one because I, I really think that I, I always mix up, I always mix up just being at peace with with happiness. I, I personally mix that up a lot of times because I think that I feel happy when I'm just when things are just chill, mm. you know. And um, maybe it goes back to my other the other answer where I'm sitting with my with my family and. Uh, we do share our stories over, over dinner or a meal and everybody has, everybody's having a good day. Like everybody had something good happen to them. And that makes me, that would make me feel happy. I would say, yeah, yeah. Let's do that. Back to the family again. Love it. Love it. Let's wrap it up. Anything you want to give uh, the audience to take away from today's show? Well, I would say, I would say um, back to probably back to the same, the, 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 the hack attack um, would probably be a, a positive thing. So for one, for good about what I said about scanning, because we don't have to worry about that anymore. And then <laughs> the look for opportunities, um, look for um, a lot of people tell you that, um, uh, and Fred, uh, Craig Cowan just went through this um, barefoot forge. He went, he went looking for a, a, a Volkswagen, he collects Volkswagen vans. And uh, so shout out to Craig. Uh, he went looking for a van and it wasn't, he went, drove like 750 miles or something. And it, it was no, no go. He said, told the guy he was not going to buy it, you know, and he <laughs> drove a long ways to get there. Several states he drove through. And he uh, just happened to, on the way back, he was just like, oh, well, whatever. It was just a fun road trip. He just happened to look again. I don't know if it was on Facebook marketplace or where it was but found a better version of what it was he went for. But he, I think it was his surrender, his acceptance to the fact that he just drove 750 miles for nothing and just said, oh, well, because he said it on his, on his Instagram. He was like, oh, you know, whatever. I just, you know, I, I just, I'm not going to buy it just because I drove all this way. And he hmm. just accepted it. And he, and he found another one that was, that was better. It was one of those things. It was kind of like meant to be like, he was just like, okay. So I think, um, and he, the way he said it was that, um, when one door closes, another one opens, you know, you've heard that one before. Yeah, man. So I think as far as that takeaway goes is to not, not, um, not labor over the closing door. You know, just uh, like, and it's, it's not just from me. It's like my, my, my business partner in the past. Remember I told you that those guys, the, his partners were, you know, he was looking at the open door. 
he wasn't looking at a door closing. Like they were saying, you're going to put us out of business. You know, he was like, what, what is, wait, you know, what's, what's this door that's opening now? Hmm. Not, not worrying about the, what does it mean? You know, it's spending time on the closing doors. It just doesn't, you know, I mean, not to say that there's not nothing there. It's just that, you know, there's probably a door opening if you, if you look, if you take a minute and just, you know, look for it. So. Hundred percent, man. Uh, yeah. Where can people find you, Bernie? So, when I was uh, looking to get on socials a few years ago, um, I I was able to get Works by Solo. So it's either three words, Works by Solo, or it's all one word. It's all spelled the same though. So at Works by Solo. So that's my. Um, I'm on uh, YouTube, Instagram. Twitter, Instructables is a big one. Um, that one, if anybody out there hasn't looked into Instructables, any of the makers that would like to publish their their projects, Instructables has a lot of benefits to it. So they can find me there. Um, I usually forget that one. That's why I brought that up. Um, as much as I don't care to do anything with Facebook, um, I am on Facebook also. It's worked by Solo. So I think okay. that's pretty much it. I'm not on not on uh, Reddit or other things. Uh, TikTok also recently. I've been on, got on TikTok. So it well, works by solo again. Yeah, you yeah. can't forget your 3 million viewed uh, electric motor, can you? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and those, um, yeah. So, uh, and those followers, uh, I've looked at my in- analytics and most of them are f- in Cambodia. So, <laughs> shout, out, shout out to Cambodia. <laughs> I love <her>, Cambodia. <laughs> They're like, this new technology, we're going to take it to Cambodia. Uh, they think they can make power with it, yeah. So, <laughs> uh, Thank you so much, Bertie, for coming on the show. Thanks for sharing your epic journey of you know, all the things you've done in your life. It's been amazing. Um, I want to thank you oh, all sure. for so much for listening. And you know, if you're not following Bernie already, I suggest you go do so right now. Uh, if you want to support the show, Tell your friends about the show. Um, and if you've told all your friends already and they're now blocking you on Facebook and other social media, you can also <laughs> support me just as much by creating a limited edition Make Ideas Reality Works by Solo Fridget Spinner, hint, hint, wink, wink, uh, or <laughs> by had hijacking the Goodyear blimp and flying it over all major capital cities advertising this podcast as the best makeup that podcast <laughs> in the world. <laughs> Let's just say that. that would work. <laughs> if you want to give me some feedback, you can send your DMs to at Garage Avenger on Instagram. Uh, please go check out Bernie Solo at Works by Solo if you haven't already. Links are in the show notes. Until next time, keep pushing yourself, keep ballsing up things, keep learning, get inspired, and I'll catch you on the flip side. Thanks, Bernie. You're a legend, mate. Thank you.